Welcome back to Timo's Dinky Detailing. Today I'm going to restore a Dinky 162 Ford Zephyr. This is the second Ford Zephyr I've done. I, if you've been following, there's another one you can see. This one is in equally poor condition. It was well played with. It's uh, got other stuff painted on it. In this case, you can actually read it. It says, Little English, Cup of Tea. So this is a Canadian child, and I uh, thought that was funny. And I have a feeling this kid was playing with these and was watching demolition derbies on TV because that's what they look like. Um, anyway, this one, uh, you can see it's, it's, uh, it's a bit rough, but I think the casting might be okay. So we'll take the bottom off and, uh, we'll, and then we'll strip the paint. So I'm starting, and this time I'm doing it by hand which means that there's probably somebody in the house who's sleeping or somebody I don't want to disturb. I don't remember. And I'm using, this This is a smaller drill, but it's a center pointed drill and it's about the right size and it's working okay for me. And we'll just pry the base off with a, with a screwdriver. So the base looks a little bit rough. It's got some rust on it but it'll be fine, they always are. And the casting looks generally in pretty good condition, so it's going into the milling machine. And I put some soft, spongy material around it, so I don't know why, maybe it'd be better just to put it with the steel, but I think that kind of gives it uh, a little bit of friction so it's less likely to move around. So I line up and do my sander drilling and then in the same position, I can drill, top drill. And I, I always go with lubricant because it's very easy to break off a drill or a tap because this uh, metal is chewy. Now here's a new tool I'm using. You see that spring action? I had to modify this tool because it didn't have this feature, but it has a little cup. And on the end of the tap is a point. So I put the cup into the point and because it's on a spring as I turn it in the tap goes in and this and the spring takes up the slack and so that keeps the tap perfectly aligned to the spindle of the mill and where the drill hole was drilled so this is a great tool I'm really pleased that I got it I had to modify it because they're supposed to come with that cup on the one end and you can reverse it so there's a point on the other. This one came just with the point and I deliberately ordered it because I knew I could put it in the lathe and put a cup into it. So there you go there's spring and you can see as I tap it the guide comes down and it keeps it straight. I didn't clean that shaft up enough. Um, I'll have to do that later and in a future episode you'll see it being more clean. So now I got my holes tapped perfectly straight and I put my 440 button head cap screws in there and that'll protect the holes uh, when it's being painted and the paint's being stripped. So the remaining tires, like usual, they're totally dried up and there's no chance of rescuing those. So I just break them off and then I go with my file. The one end of the file has been ground off. This is a quality file. It's a it's a Nicholson file and I've ground the, the uh, teeth off of one edge so I'm not filing into the wheel. And so for me, I find this is the fastest and easiest way and it's the quietest way so I don't disturb other people in the house rather than coming out with a Dremel tool and trying to grind that off. So the base is good. It's gonna have to be stripped. Those go in the garbage and evapo rust is super safe stuff i i don't get any money from them if they want to give me money i'd be happy to and i always show this stuff it's very safe rust remover but it takes time so usually i put it in and leave it overnight now for the windshield i'm going to try something different i, I want to use a uh, vacuum forming plastic uh, machine that uh, dentists use and but I need a form to uh, to wrap around so I I'm going to try this uh, this is modeling putty that you uh, model and then you put it in the oven 
and I'm looking at this and I'm going, okay, pu pushing it in there, it looks terrible, it's not going to work. You would, you would put this in the oven and harden it before I would wrap the plastic around it, but it's no good. So, meanwhile, I'm going to be doing an interior, so in the computer using uh, Tinkercad, I'm uh, copying the front seat to move it over to the other side. I modeled the whole thing in this on a previous episode, and uh, I'm using the same seats and just squishing and moving them around. Same with the, with the whole opening for the seats. Then I save it as an STL file. And as an STL file, it has all the 3D information. Now I move over to my other screen and open up Windows 7 behind my, on my Macintosh. And open ChichuBox and it opens the STL file. And now I tilt it. And because you need to print these things, it's a, there's a whole art to this. And this is actually, I've already figured out a better way of printing these. But you tilt it so that it gives you a better finish. And uh, there's a way of getting fewer of those little supports for using, for using my uh, 3D printer. So I put the files onto a thumb drive. It goes into my Mars 2 printer that I bought on Kijiji. And I've already set this up. Uh, you have to you have to set it up, initialize it so that it's zeroed to the plate. But I already did that. Uh, so now here I go in and I select there's my Zephyr seats and then press play and that causes the plate to come down. So this is speeded up because this is the whole thing goes in slow motion. So it goes up and down, and now you can see the screen shows you what... There's a screen underneath the, the plate on the printer, and when it turns on, it's like a, it's like com, it's a computer screen, but it's black and white. But it puts out uh, UV light, and each layer is printed uh, for a few seconds. So here the thing is done, and I've got a vat full of isopropyl alcohol for cleaning off the excess and then I've got a little thing that holds it into the into the vat that I printed and designed myself and I go in and with the toothbrush I clean off the stuff that's off the top of the plate the print plate and then I try and shake it it's, it's been in there for a while and it dissolves most of the excess uh, resin and then it goes into my paint booth because that stuff stinks and the isopropyl alcohol does too and they break off all those little supports and now the thing's ready it goes into the this is a hardener it's uh, puts UV light and then it has a little turntable and it spins it and when it's done uh, it's all hardened so now we see if it fits into the casting and lo and behold, it does. So I did a good job of measuring that and getting it right. And it's and it's actually a copy of of one that was done for an earlier toy, but I just adjusted the dimensions by pushing and pulling in the uh, Tinkercad until it was right. And then I've got a steering wheel that I printed earlier, and uh, that's going to go into the uh, into the uh, interior. So here's the. Here's the base that's been overnight in the Vapo Rust, and it's taken off. You can see it's all black, but it's taken off all of the the finish. And the finish, I'm told, is uh, it's blued like you would uh, gun bluing. And it turns out that the that the uh, Vapo Rust takes off the gun bluing. So here's the paint. I've gone into the backyard. See, this was done a while ago. There was still snow. And I'm on the deck outside the back door and in goes the boiling water and the uh, caustic soda and I speeded through that you don't need to see it bubbling but it took off all the paint and then I take it to the wire brush on the drill press
So now it's all shiny and I'm trying to gain with the windshield. So I've, my other method is to try to 3D print. So I'm 3D printing the windshield and this is my first attempt at a transparent windshield. It's the wrong size, so I'm filing it to shape. It looks terrible. And look at all these different versions I've tried already. So this one kind of kind of fits in, but it looks like hell. I, I mean, I could finish it off and and cover it with some clear coat and it might look okay, but I'm still struggling with it. So here I got the casting ready. There's a big divot in the on the hood that I think is from the original casting. It's not it's not from play. It was filled with paint. And I fixed all the little defects. It wasn't too much on this one. It was it's still in pretty good shape. And into the spray booth for some primer. And I'm using as usual the Tamiya fine surface primer in white. I do 99% of my stuff with the white primer because the gray primer is only good for darker colors. So if I have a darker color, then I'll use the gray primer. And here I'm putting satin black paint from a spray can in, onto the base. And primer goes onto the hubs. So here's another attempt at the windshield. This is with the clear uh, resin, but uh, it has to put these supports and put a bunch of supports on the windshield. The thing doesn't really fit very well. It's really hard to model this thing, especially since the roof of the car is curved and Tinkercad is not good with that stuff. It's it's very basic sort of drafting program. So so I've got one that this is a well there's a second one and well, here's a third one. That one was a different design. I keep modifying it, and this is the one that was done first in the clear. And with the clear, that was a bit of trouble, so I had trouble getting it to print anything. And finally I got this one, which actually looks pretty good, and then I did the rear window separately, because then I can don't get the supports interfering. So none of them worked, including this one, but I have another idea. Uh, I want to use the vacuum forming, and so I bought this stuff. I didn't buy the vacuum forming machine, but I bought the stuff that goes into it. So they're five by five plastic sheets. So get one out. Problem is, I realized that I chose these. This is the soft stuff. It's for splints. It's not for, it's, it doesn't make a hard surface. I thought, okay, I'm going to try it anyway. So I, the back window was wrong. And, and so I just glued a, the, my little black back window on there and sanded it down and I stuck this thing on the end of a piece of wood and get a candle and I'm going to try this just as a just as an experiment so I heat up the plastic and then stretch it around my form and we'll see what the thing looks like uh, now I can it's, it's hot and I don't want to hold it there for too long so I use my uh, canned wind and if you turn it upside down, stuff comes out cold. So it quickly sets it. I cut it off with a knife. And then let's see what the thing looks like in the car. It, it looks like crap. <laughs> Maybe it would look better if I had done it with the vacuum machine, but it's useless. So. I'm probably not going to buy one of those vacuum machines because the problem is I need a form. If I, if I had a windshield and I was reproducing it, that would be great, but I don't have a windshield. There was never a windshield for this. So I've sanded the uh, primer down. I put another coat and it's ready for the first coat of paint. So here I'm mixing up uh, Mr. Hobby paints. So it's going to be two-tone. So this is a, this is going to be a light blue. I'm not going to show you all of the mixing because it's just too boring. And I put in this leveling thinner. This is the stuff that when you spray it on with the leveling thinner, uh, it stays the the paint stays uh, soft longer, so it has time to smooth out and level. So even though it might look a little bit like it's not shiny when you spray it on, then you leave it for 10 minutes. And it becomes shiny. It's it's uh, it's a miracle stuff. 
And that's what I use now on all of these things when I'm mixing my own paints. So here the light blue goes on and we go to the end of the sequence. And I'm going in and I'm making sure that it uh, looks as shiny as possible without putting so much paint that it runs. And it's quite a challenge to do and that's that's what airbrushing is all about. So here I'm doing the the hubs and I'm using this block and it's got so many layers of paint that I go and blow some paint onto it and it chips off some of the old paint. I'll probably have to do something, sand this thing down or something. So here's the other, the, I did the inside of the base and there I did the outside. And now I always go in and I polish up my paint because there's always high points and if you want to have a nice finish you have to sand it and that's what they do with rail cars. They sand the whole thing until it's smooth and then they put the next coat of paint. In this case I'm not putting an next coat of paint, I'm taping it. I'm, I, the the, the uh, light blue finish is, is sanded but doesn't matter because it's going to get clear coat at the end. But I'm not going to put the clear coat until I've painted my second color. So this is a good time to uh, remember to uh, subscribe to my channel so you don't miss any of these videos and also to like, to give it a thumbs up. It doesn't cost anything, you can do it right now. It's the little thumb that points upward. And don't forget to share it as well with your friends. So getting this tape, this is that Nito tape. It's a Japanese tape and apparently people don't like the uh, Tamiya. They have a stretchy tape as well, but it's apparently not as good as this one. I'm really happy with this one because I'm able to uh, get it to work everywhere. And so here I've, I'm, I've got a piece of paper and I've put the, uh, the ordinary masking tape, the Tamiya masking tape on the edge. I don't want to tape up all the paint, just just the edges where I already put that stuff. And actually when I put that on, by the way, I, I, I put the sticky part on my fingers first. I, I, I reduce the stickiness so it's less likely to pull the paint off of the model. And that's worked for me um, all along now since I started doing that. So now I'm mixing up a little bit darker paint. So I start with the it's a bright blue paint and I add some white and I'll have to add some more. I don't want it quite that dark. And you can see I'm mixing it up in an old jar that I've that was actually had white in it before. And you can still see white around the rim. And here I'm thinning it using Mr. Hobby leveling thinner again to make sure that it's shiny. So into the airbrush. and to the spray booth. So we'll jump ahead to when I'm just finishing it up. And I get it to, to the point where it's shiny but doesn't run. That's what everybody tells you. But it's true, you have to do it that way. And it's a lot easier with an airbrush to achieve that. So here we're peeling it off. That's the problem with putting the paper on. It's, it's a bit of a challenge to take it off again without damaging the paint. And there I'm tearing it all apart. Here I got the tape on it. And finally that part is off. And I'm down to the, to the white plastic tape. That's the, the flexible tape. It lets you go around corners a, a little bit. But I find it gives you a really good edge even if I if, even if I unsticky the tape with my fingers before putting it on. It still keeps a nice clean edge. This is a this is a pattern and color scheme from the original Dinky Toy. The only thing is I have it wrap around that front grill, you might have noticed. Uh, because the real car it wraps around the front grill. Dinky didn't do that because it's just be way too much trouble in the factory to have to tape around the uh, grill like that. So I'd put some tape around the wheel wells so that the inside would look a little cleaner just with the light blue. 
but the wheel wells would have the darker blue paint on it. So I'm going in with my uh, with my uh, sandpaper uh, because I need to take off a little paint that oversprayed because it's hard to tape around these. There's there's these features on the car that are chrome, and so it's hard to tape around them. So the paint got underneath the, the edge, and instead of trying to take it off some other way, I just used a little bit of sandpaper. So here's my dot painter. This is for painting dots on uh, when you're varnishing ladies' nails. And it's brilliant because it lets you put a nice controlled daub of paint where you want it. And it's perfect for doing tail lights, indicator lights. So here I'm doing a license plate or a number plate, uh, but I'm using a clear um, number plate. So I need to have a white background. So I'm just putting a piece of plain um, water slide white backed decal there. And when it dries, I put my clear black with white letters and decal over top of it. And those letters otherwise are transparent. So they're going to show whatever color is behind it. So I need to have that white behind it. Getting a little bit better at doing these things. And here I'm using a piece of tissue to dry the decal um, because when you use a, a, a cotton bud, or q-tip to dry it off then it tends to move the decal so there I painted a coat of clear coat and now we're going to paint these seats so there's my steering wheel I'm gonna to have to paint that as well this one I printed a long time ago it's with the green stuff I wouldn't advise using the plant-based green it, it stinks so bad I, I'll never use it again and I've thrown out the rest of it because it makes the whole house stink even though I'm using it in my spray booth. So here I'm putting, this is from the spray can, the black satin paint. I paint the base with that as well. And here's the seats and I'm painting the bottom of the seats. I always paint it black because it's visible through the wheel wells. So here's my recreational white, which is a propane can paint and that's what my interior color is going to be. So now doing the detail on the headlights, this is something I like to do because it's very hard to paint a perfect circle on these things, at least for me. But I like to have a silver rim around my headlights and so I've punched a hole in the tape and then I get it on there as best I can and then I go in with the Molotov uh, chrome ink from these uh, these chrome markers. Put it a little bit on the bottom of a uh, shot glass and then go in with a fine brush. Now after it's had a chance to dry I can peel those off and then do my front grill with the same chrome paint. This has a detailed grill. It, it wraps around and it's uh, it's kind of cool and it really looks cool when it's finished because I did the other one and I just love it. It just looks great. Now the, I'm putting a little bit of blue. I didn't quite spray it well enough so that part underneath the bumper was not dark enough. So I've touched that up as well as part of the detailing and then do my chrome bumpers. Now here's that little decoration on the front fenders. So I make those chrome as well. This is in the 50s. Everything, everything was decorated with chrome. And I think it's fantastic because now everything is just plastic. But this, these cars, they, they stand out today if you see these things restored because of all the chrome on them. They just look beautiful. So again, the clear uh, decal would show the background color. So you have to put white behind it if you want to have white letters. Or even if you wanted to have like very light color, like yellow or something. Uh, you need to have the white background. 
So here, see I'm trying to do it with the Q-tip, but it wants to move the thing. So I've painted the uh, interior and for the stick shift, and this time I'm putting a russet knob on the, on the gear shift. And here's my black painted steering wheel. That goes in there. And it looks good. So the decal has, uh, the blank decal is dried. So now I can put the number plate on top of it. And like Ain, those letters are transparent. Um, and they would show whatever colors behind it. So you need to have white behind it if you want to have white letters. You can see it a little bit there that it's, that it's transparent. So I'm using the paintbrush that's soaked in water. It's kind of handy for moving it around and, and putting water on there before I put the decal on. And then I don't want the thing to move once I get it in place. So I daub off the water with a tissue. The tissue doesn't move the number plate around. And here I'm putting white where the actual glass part of the headlight and just leaving the chrome ring around it which I find looks terrific and this thing has a has a badge on it and I looked at the original badge it's got a red field at the bottom there's a a, a, a black field right near the bottom and then there's a yellow lion on the badge so I'm going in with my finest brush nail painting brush and there you can clearly see a lion There's the back, and we do the chrome on the bumper. Fair amount of detail on this model. And then there's a filler cap at the back. And it's pretty easy to get the uh, door handles done because they're quite pronounced. So it's easy to keep the paint off of the rest of the bodywork. So I'm pretty happy with that. This one, I touch it up a little bit better than I did the first time. Again, I'm using, this is a paint paintbrush for varnishing ladies' nails. And I got these off of Amazon and they're terrific because look how short the br bristles are on this brush and there's this massive piece of metal that's holding it in place. It gives you a lot of control. The bristles don't tend to go where you don't want them to go when they're this short. So there's my windshield. Looks like crap. So that's didn't work out for me so I'm gonna go with my old style of doing a windshield which is to use a piece of plastic from wrapping um, box wrapping now what do you call it it's when it's from these soap soap uh, box and then it has a plastic all the way around it so you can see the soap inside the box my wife buys those at Costco and so I have that plastic and it's perfect for doing these windshields so First I make a paper pattern and in this case I used one of these 3D printed windshields that's close to the right size so it's a little bit more convenient when I'm cutting this out so I use that so at least I got some value out of those prints that I made so many of and then I go with this clear plastic and I've learned to cut much further into the roof more, it looks like a Maltese cross because then it it conforms better the the roof is curved so the plastic needs to conform to the curve and if and if you have it too close it just wants to be a square and that does you know can't fit the square onto a curve and I actually save this paper because if I'm ever doing a Zephyr in the future this one this the glass came out really good on this and so I want to have the pattern so I don't have to make a new one. So it goes in with some five minute epoxy. This is terrific epoxy I get from the dollar store. 
and I'll put it onto the ceiling I guess of the car and put in the plastic and then you can see the those cracks that I cut in there they come right together that's the advantage of cutting way in there so I put some some uh, little uh, a parallel and a little block and a bigger block on top so I've got some pressure uh, so for five minutes the epoxy has a chance to cure and there looks beautiful so I'm going to keep doing this and I won't be buying that vacuum press as much as I want to buy a new toy this is not going to work for me so here I'm preparing the axles and I use just a center drill and I go into the end of the axle I've got a special clamping system there that holds the uh, the, the axle shaft and then I loosen it up it pops out oh, got to move the tailstock and then I can take out I have to take out that uh, mini collet that goes inside the big collet and there you can see it's kind of dished and after doing that I go to the to the uh, grinder where I have a buffing wheel and I go in and I I buff these axles so they're all nice and shiny buff the head And it makes it look it makes it look more like a new toy when the axles are nice and polished like this. So here's my hubs that have been painted and my usual uh, O-rings that are exact size of these dinky toy tires. I've used so many of these. Uh, it would cost me a fortune buying ones that are molded to that shape when I found, fortunately, that somebody made a... Uh, an o-ring for some plumbing purpose that's exactly the right size then I got my vice grips that are ground with a groove in it so it holds the axle nicely and I go with the hammer that I made when I was in school and it takes a bit of tapping but it's light tapping I don't want to bend the axle but with that with that uh, little divot drilled into the end it makes it mushroom properly and it's much easier than when just using the end of a plane shaft so this is a trick that uh, I find works really really well Now to clean it up a little bit, I've got this uh, this shaft. I put it in the hammer drill. It makes a lot of noise, and that uh, improves it a little bit. I'm not sure it's worth doing. So there we have it. My wheels on the base rolls beautifully. So now I put my interior in, the glass is already there, just line it up properly and get the base on there. And I have my painted 440 button head cap screws that match the lighter color on the body. I think it looks terrific, looks like a beautiful new toy. So let's remind you where we began. So this is the uh, sad looking toy that I bought and paid way too much for. <laughs> but that's how it works now. These, these crappy toys cost just as much as one that's in really good condition. Because to model these, or to restore these, you don't want one that's in good condition. You want one that looks like this. So the funny thing is it has value now. So this looked pretty rough and all that stuff I think some child enjoyed it so it has good energy so let's see what it looks like now so that's the sort of toy that you'd want to get as a birthday present and uh, you would just fall in love with this thing looks beautiful it's got the colors that uh, Dinky had originally or something resembling it 
and I've added a few embellishments with the tail lights and license plates and the enhanced chrome. So I hope you enjoyed this episode of Timo's Dinky Detailing. I certainly enjoyed doing this toy and it uh, came out beautifully. Hope to see you next time. Until then, be seeing you.